Uh, right, so uh, so uh, I'm Simon Blackburn. This is this is Royal Holloway. This is where I'm from, uh, and uh, the, uh, my other two co-authors are from uh, uh, Barland University in uh, uh, in Israel. Ali Bensley is uh, here in the conference. Uh, she's a student of Boaz at uh, Saban, and this was a result of a, of a project when she came to visit Royal Holloway last um, last summer. Um, so uh, I want to talk about, about cryptanalysis of the algebraic eraser. This is a scheme that was introduced a while ago now, in 2002, by Anshul, Anshul, Goldfelt, and uh, Lemieux. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a key exchange primitive, a bit like Diffie-Hellman, similar sort of uh, protocol flow, but it's based on uh, matrix groups and permutation groups and braid groups. So it's a group-based crypt system. So as a, as a field, group-based cryptography, I think, in general, has a poor reputation. There's been a lot of, at the moment, certainly, uh, the, the many schemes which aren't great that have been proposed. However, um, Angela Anshul and Goldfeld, in particular, produced some beautiful papers um, early on with some lovely ideas in. So I think it's always interesting to, uh, to see um, uh, anything that this uh, group comes up with, because the, the ideas are, uh, uh, are worth thinking about. And one of the reasons that I first became interested in, in this um, area, uh, really because uh, Secure RF, uh, a company, US company, they're the owners of, of the, the uh, algebraic eraser, and they're actually out there marketing it for the for Internet of Things applications. So uh, in particular, in 2015, uh, 2015 they uh, have uh, proposed to ISO uh, standards uh, body a, um, uh, an algebraic eraser-based RFID, RFID tag uh, authentication protocol. So, um, so if you actually go to the QRF um, website, in fact, they've uh, replaced that by a, 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 a different protocol due to uh, attacks on this, uh, this protocol. Okay, so uh, right, so I was, became interested in this uh, uh, slightly earlier when uh, um, uh, Kenny Patterson told me that they were presenting to the uh, IRTF, and uh, so I was uh, uh, interested. It's always interesting from, a, from my perspective as a group theorist and a cryptographer. Uh, if something's getting close to standards, it's really time to look at a, a script system um, uh, uh, in a bit more depth. So, uh, okay, so this uh, protocol has had a, um, a, a earlier attacks on it. So, uh, in particular, um, in 2008, there was uh, an attack by uh, Miyazlokov and Ushakov uh, using something called a um, length-based attack, if you know what that is, which break the, the parameters which were originally proposed in the paper. Okay. Um, so uh, this basically says that the parameters are too small because this length-based attack scales very badly. So in fact, uh, uh, Gunnels uh, recommended uh, just increasing the parameter sizes slightly, and that would... Um, that would uh, um, uh, avoid this attack. So it's not, in some sense, a particularly serious attack because there's an easy, uh, uh, an, an easy remedy. But more or less at the same time, uh, again, to January 2008, uh, there was a more serious attack due to Kalka, Tycho, and Saban, which really break the scheme uh, convincingly for generic parameters. So what do I mean by generic parameters? The uh, one of the things that's strange about the algebraic eraser is that the choice of certain parts of the, of the uh, public parameters of the scheme, um, the, the algorithm for generating these public parameters isn't specified by the, by the scheme. It just says we, you choose these things. Right? It's not, so, not said how. So as a crypt analyst, you're kind of in a weird, difficult situation, right? Because it's security by under specification. Okay? So all you can do, well, all, all, all they did was say, well, okay, let's choose these things at random subject to being uh, to all the publicly known constraints. So, that there's a, so it's a convincing attack for these generic parameters. And this was responded to uh, in a paper by Goldfeld and Gunnels, a preprint, which said basically you can avoid the attack by a careful choice of system parameters. Okay? So I'll, I'll give a bit more detail about, about that um, uh, in a second. So there it is. So uh, and what's this work about? It's an attack that recovers the key for 128-bit parameters. Uh, the parameters are provided by SecureRF in just eight hours on a single core in Magma, two gigahertz core. Right? So I can't really imagine a, a more convincing uh, 
attack on, on the scheme. There we go. So I'll give a bit more detail about this. Um, now, uh, so it's quite a technical scheme in lots of ways, the algebraic eraser. So I'm, I can't give all the details in a 20 minute talk, so I'll try to keep it as non-technical as I can. So, algebraic eraser Diffie-Hellman, it's a key agreement scheme, just like Diffie-Hellman, same kind of protocol uh, flow. There are two parameters that are picked. First of all, for 128 bit parameters, we have N, which is 16. And these are N by N matrices, okay, as part of the scheme. And Q is 256, Q is a, a field size. So these, th th so the, the, these are 16 by 16 matrices whose uh, entries are elements of a finite field that just fits inside a byte. Okay, eight bits. And now in Diffie-Hellman, the things that are, that are passed between the two parties are integers modulo P, classically. So here, they're not integers, they're actually pairs. The first thing is a matrix M, which is the M by M matrix with entries in GFQ. And the second thing is a permutation. Right? This is just a permutation of n objects, in this case, 16 objects. Okay. Right. So what happens is Diffie-Hellman side protocol. What happens is Alice generates some private information, which I'll come to in a second. Right. Alice then computes the public key, which is a matrix MA and a permutation sigma A from omega, sends that to Bob. Bob does a similar thing. He generates private information in some way uses this to compute a public key, sends this to Alice. And then what both parties do is compute a shared value, matrix M and permutation sigma, by using the information provided by the other party and the information they've generated privately. Right? So it's very similar to Diffie-Hellman at this level, apart from your, the, the, the things you're transmitting from one side to the other. Okay. Now, in fact, the way it works is that sigma is actually computable by anybody. So sigma isn't really a, uh, a uh, private information at all. So you would take M and you'd try to derive the shared key from M. Right? So M is the shared key. Right? So sigma is just something that you sort of use to compute M and then you can throw away because it's public. OK. Right. So, uh, right, it's a group-based scheme. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, 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 now the private information that Alice and Bob use to generate their public key. And this is, uh, uh, this is an, part of an, an infinite group from an infinite group. So this is equivalent to sort of the uh, group in the exponent in Diffie-Hellman, right? So that's, that's just the integers under addition or integers modulo p minus 1, something like that. So here, the equivalent to the, the group in the exponent is the colored Borough group. It's got this sort of uh, cool symbol here. This is a semi-direct product. G uh, GLN, FQ, T minus TN, semi-direct product, symmetric group on N letters. Now, if you're a group theorist, that's fine. Let me just tell you what this is, though. This is a group. The elements of the group are pairs of matrices M and sigma. Sigma is just a permutation as before. Now, M is an N by N matrix, but its entries are in FQ. They're quotients of, uh, of, of uh, polynomials in the, in the variables T1 up to TN. Right? So this is, a, this is a, there's infinitely many possibilities for these things, so it's some sort of infinite group. So these are the elements. And to multiply them, so you multiply these two elements, so an element is a pair, M sigma. To multiply two of these things together, you just compose the two permutations, right? So that bit's easy. How do you, how do you multiply the two, well, you, you think you might multiply the two matrices together, but first of all, what you do to one of the matrices is you just permute the variables, T1 up to Tn, by using the permutation sigma first, right? So if uh, sigma mapped 1 to 2, you'd replace all the things in which, were in which were T1 in the matrix by T2, right, first, before you do the multiplication. So this is a color barrow bar bar group, and th this is related to um, some sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's related to topological group theory, which is studied by. Okay. Right, so this is the most technical slide. So if you can get through this slide, it's a, a, you know, it's a nice, easy slide down towards the end of the talk, right? Okay. So, remember, the things we're passing between each other, uh, Alice, between Alice and Bob, are matrices with entries in FQ. So how do you get from these infinite matrices with polynomial entries into entries modulo Q? Well, there's an obvious kind of way of doing it. You just replace all the uh, entries, the variables T1 up to Tn in your matrix, by particular values, call them, let's say, tor1 up to tor n in FQ. Okay? 
That gives you a matrix with entries in FQ. And if you do this in the right way, you get a map down to GLNQ. Okay? So I say this isn't for the whole of this general linear group because you've got to have some condition on the subgroup so that this actually is a map. Okay, there we go. So this is some map um, uh, phi. So, so now this is equivalent in Diffie-Hellman of exponentiation, right? You take an entry in uh, S pi in omega, that's the thing you're going to pass backwards and forwards from Alice and Bob. You have your sort of expo exponent thing, which is a matrix and, uh, 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 and a permutation in this big infinite group. You do find something called, the, well, the authors call uh, E multiplication, right? Which is this star notation, which is combining these two things, which is kind of like exponentiation. The permutation thing, again, is very easy. You just compose the two permutations, right? You kind of, what you do is you, well, you, you the, the simplest thing to do, you think of taking the matrix M and you uh, evaluate it to get a, a, a matrix with entries over FQ and just do no, normal matrix multiplication. But before you evaluate it, you permute the variables of the matrix by using the permutation pi. Okay, so a little twist. So that's E multiplication. And then what, and, okay, and then how do you do, how, how do you actually do the protocol in more detail? You first of all to choose com commuting subgroups of A and, a and B of the color bar, bar group. What's commuting mean? It means if you take any A and A and B and B, then A, B equals B, A, right? So you, you, you produce them in some way, and the, the uh, authors of the scheme don't tell you how to do this, right? And then you do the same. You take two com commuting subgroups C and D of GLNQ. You choose them in some way, right? And the, author, the authors of the scheme don't tell you how to do this. Right. What Alice does is pick something from the matrix, uh, 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 an infinite group element from A, and a matrix in C, and sends something to Bob. She takes the pair in omega, which is the identity matrix and the identity permutation. Star multiplies it with the infinite element A. That's kind of like an exponentiation, and then multiplies it on the other side by the matrix C. So what this this means is just. You've got matrix entries in FQ, you just multiply. So, so the result of this star multiplication is matrix comma permutation. You kind of ignore the permutation and multiply that matrix C by that first matrix, and replace that matrix, that's a product. That's just basically matrix product, but ignoring the second entry. Right. Bob picks the same thing, picks, but, but picks D in D and B in, in B. So B is an ent entry in this big group. D is just a matrix and sends this thing to Valis. And then the share, the common key, you just do the same operation to the thing you, re you, you received, same kind of exponentiation style operation. So, so Bob takes the information he gets from Alice, multiplies it on uh, the right by star B, and on the left by D. And just because these things commute and everything seems to work, that's the same as what Alice does. Alice just takes the information she gets from Bob, Star multiplies it by A and multiplies it on the left by C. Okay. So I can see that we, your kind of spirit sank at about there, I think. I can see your faces. That's the end of the technical bits of the slide, really. The, the main thing is in, interested is you pick some random stuff, subgroups A, B, and C, and D in some way. Okay. Right. So how does the... Uh, 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 Kalka Taika Saban approach work. This is the previous attack. Well, as an adversary, you get the main, the basic parameters of the scheme, which are the size of matrices n, the field size q, and these elements tor i that you use to evaluate. Right? Everybody has to evaluate at various stages in order to do this star multiplication. And um, you would also get um, some public information, which is the uh, generate uh, uh, group C of matrices and the subgroup A of the colored Burrell group. Okay. Now this is a, a, an unusual scheme in that the public parameters for Alice are slightly different to the public parameters for Bob. Right? They're different matrices. Right? Bob uses a group D of matrices and a subgroup, subgroup B of the colored Burrell group. But in order to interact, you've got to assume we, we've got access to one of them. So we just assume that we've got one of them. We don't need both. And Eve obviously gets the stuff that's transmitted backwards and forwards between Alice and Bob. Right? And the aim, of course, is to compute the shared key. And how does the attack work? 
it generates lots of elements from A and uses those elements from A to find linear information about the secret information D and the matrix part of the secret, inf the secret group element B that Bob uses to generate the, to his um, public key. And this actually, uh, and once you've got collected enough of these relations, this linear information, you can then find D up to a scalar, right? The, matri the, 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 um, um, uh, the, uh, the matrix that Bob uses up to a scalar, okay, generically. That's phase one. Then the next phase two uses some clever algorithm from permutation group theory to find some equivalent element A dashed with the same, uh, in, in this group A, with the same permutation as the uh, 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 pair that was transmitted from Alice to Bob. Okay. And th th these two pieces of information are enough to derive the shared key, turns out. Now, both of these phases are heuristic, but they're practical for random system parameters. So, Gunnels and Gilfold responded to this attack, and their attack basically said that their response is saying, ah, choose C very carefully. We haven't said this before, but we're actually going to choose C carefully. Right? And what happens here is if you choose C carefully, all this linear information basically collapses. You don't get enough linear relations. So you don't, so even though in, for generic parameters, this uh, linear information gives you D up to a scalar, if it's carefully chosen subgroup C, it doesn't give you enough information. Okay. So how does our new approach work? Right, it uses the same information as before, right? The public parameters, Alice's public information, and the uh, uh, information transmitted between Alice and Bob. In phase zero, it's called zero because it's really a pre-computation phase, it's before Eve gets this last piece of information. You can, Eve generates lots of words in the generators of A whose associated permutation is trivial. So it's quite similar to one of the phases in the, um, in the previous attack. And then once she's got some of this, this extra stuff, in phase one, Alice finds a, a group element A twiddles whose permutation agrees with A. Right, she, can, she, she knows this because of the permutation she, agreeing with A she gets from this piece of information which is transmitted from Alice to Bob. But rather than finding the secret information uh, uh, D, she actually tries to find the secret information C, the stuff, more stuff to do with Alice. This, is to do with, this, this generates more linear relations, different kind of linear relations. We use a, a, this, this part is, is uh, very different to the uh, calculator attack. When she's found this, she recovers the remaining parameters in the shared key. Now, all, fa all phases in this algorithm, again, are heuristic, but they're practical. And there's a key difference, which is they don't depend on the choice of this subgroup C. They're completely blind to that choice. Okay? So the golfell gold attack is completely bypassed by this new approach. Right. All right. So, uh, right, what's the uh, outcome from this? Oh, I should say that the, these things, uh, post zero well, use this same permutation group algorithm from the previous attack. Consequences of the attack. Well, SecureRF gave, very kindly gave us 528-bit parameters uh, uh, sets, so five challenges. And, uh, and uh, this is the only way really you can cryptanalyze the scheme, right? Because otherwise, they, uh, because we don't know how these parameters are generated, right? But they've kindly provided them for, to us. And unfortunately, a non uh, for, for them, a non-optimized implementation in Magma on a single gig two gigahertz core gave an attack in eight hours. And actually, only a half of this is pre-computation. Right, so phase zero takes about four hours, and the remaining stuff takes about four hours. So this also makes the uh, ISO tag authentication protocol that's proposed by, uh, which is vulnerable to this attack. Pretty efficient attack, very efficient attack. There's been an interesting response from Secure RF on this, actually, an extremely defensive response. So they're, they're, uh, they're sort of very negative in their tone, and also they say some very strange things technically. So, for example, they say that the attack has only limited focus because all it does is recover the C shared key. It's an interesting idea of what an adversary for key agreement protocol is. Right? Um, they also say it doesn't apply many times because uh, 
uh, the adversaries assume to know the public keys? Right? Yeah, so good, good question. And of course, if you don't know the public keys, you can, you can use symmetric techniques, right, in terms of your security model. Um, so it's, the, and, there are, and actually most of the time it spends its time trashing a conjecture attributed to us that we didn't make in the paper. Right? Very strange. I mean, I, I must say, I, personally, I would be embarrassed. I would be embarrassed to produce this paper. Certainly a cryptography company. I'd, I'd be surpri I'm surprised that it would publish this. Um, so certainly I currently not recommend using the algebraic arrays of primitive in any applications. Right? Clearly. Right? Also, I'd say independent security analysis is vital. Right? In this case, there's a company that's generating parameters, not saying how these parameters are generated, and it comes with these kind of responses. That certainly knocks my confidence in what they're saying technically, whether it's going to be true or not. It needs to be verified independently. So independent security analysis is absolutely vital. There's some further discussion on this. A, a great title, Why Algebraic Arrays are Maybe the Riskiest Crypto System You've Never Heard Of. Right? By Dan Goodin in Ars Technica. It's a lovely article, actually. Dan Goodin, I've got a very high respect. He was very careful to uh, get accurate quotes from all the parties involved. Right? So he was, he was very, very careful, technically. So I've got a lot of respect for the way he wrote that article. So it's a good article. There's also, I think, a very nice thread on Cryptography Stack Exchange, which talks about this. I should say that uh, uh, Matt Robshaw and myself have got a paper in ACNS just uh, earlier this year, which gives a real-time crypt analysis of the proposed ISO protocol. Okay, so it's faster. Um, there is a new proposed ISO protocol uh, uh, after this, where they've added some uh, an, a, a hash. But my worry is that the techniques from this paper, but with uh, with Matt um, and the paper presented here, a combination of them will apply to this new proposal. So my worry is that the, 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 the I mean, cer certainly I think it would be uh, it's surprising that they're proposing an ISO protocol uh, standard at such an early stage, right? I don't see anything from the standard saying why this protocol is, not re uh, is resistant to these kind of techniques. I, I find it's very surprising that they've done this. Uh, I'm worrying, I think. It certainly worries me. Okay, so thank you very much.